sir it is 6 o'clock uh, can we start the session sir yeah you can hear me now yes sir yeah good evening a warm welcome to all of you to the webinar series hosted by advocates association bengaluru we have with us today mr amar korea advocate high court of karnataka sir we are happy to have you with us today welcome to the webinar thank you very much now i would like to introduce our today's speaker mr amar korea is the founder of amar korea associates juris he enrolled as an advocate in the year 2000 he initially joined the office of shri bv pinto former judge high court of karnataka where he was exposed to the criminal practice and later joined the office of shri anand mandagi senior advocate to gain knowledge on documentation and civil litigation so amar set up his own office in the year 2002 since then he is extensively and exclusively practicing in every area of criminal law so amar has practiced in all criminal courts that is magistrate court sessions court and the high court his practice ex extensively in the trial courts and he is also exposed on the appellate side of practice he has tremendous exposure on ndps act cyber crimes mining related offenses just to name a few presently mr amar is on the panel of advocates for the british deputy high commission chennai foreign and commonwealth office and consulate general of federal republic of germany mr amar has also been appointed as a special public prosecutor to represent state of karnataka in two criminal cases of public importance has also been appointed as amicus curiae in sessions court bengaluru and in criminal appeal before the honorable high court of karnataka sir on behalf of advocates association bengaluru i extend a warm welcome to you over to you sir thank you very much thank you very much vikram first of all i appreciate the good work started by you vikram and also which has been given a full push by the advocates association bangalore and this initiative that has been undertaken by you by the aid uh, without any doubt i can say that this has helped a lot helped tremendously to the lawyers to the younger fraternity of lawyers primarily to gain the best asset a man can ever gain in life which is the knowledge of us thank you very much for this initiative and thank you very much for having the, having given me this opportunity to address this broad research now uh, in the as far as the today topic is concerned uh, i would just tell the viewers here in that vikram and myself we just thought that it is very necessary to share and impart knowledge about trials the experience that has been gained by me as a trial lawyer and that is what and primarily towards the preparation of preparation going into a trial and the homework that is necessary to be done the knowledge towards the trial that has to be gained and this experience is what we thought is better better be shared so what i would convey even prior to commencing this talk is i would definitely touch a certain legal aspect provisions of law but more than that what i i will try to do here my endeavor here has been to put forth to give a picture of the background work that goes going into a trial and this preparation towards the trial conducting any kind of trial be it before the magistrate court be it before the sessions court in the simplest of a case where the punishment would be a little meager or in the greatest of the case where the punishment would be or uh, life imprisonment or death so the preparation that goes into a trial is what i would try to impart knowledge, knowledge on based on my experience as such now coming directly to the topic on hand what is now i will primarily as i told be touching on criminal trials alone now the necessity the sorry before that the manner of the preparation that is necessary what how it has to be strategized and the ground rules for conducting a trial 
and its successful execution as such. Now, first and foremost, what is necessary is that the trial lawyer, and this is very important, the trial lawyer has to understand that the task he has taken upon himself, the load that he has taken upon himself, which is of conducting a trial, is a very huge load. This is a very huge task. Given that, it equally is necessary that this huge load has to be carried and the task executed in a with a with very much and with immense preparation and effort such. The reason need not be stated much on this primarily for the primarily it is it's not difficult for anybody to understand that the result herein would be that there would be a sentencing which can vary from a single day in prison and which can go up to death. Given this, given this huge load that the trial law carries, preparation is very much important as such. Now, what also the trial law needs to know is that by conducting the trial, the he bears the entire load of the case commencing from the court where the trial is being conducted to the higher courts. If the trial is before the magistrate court, then from there, the trial lawyer who conducts the trial there carries the load also. If the trial is before the sessions court and there the punishments can go even up to death imprisonment, then even at that stage and more importantly, the trial lawyer, the trial lawyer has to understand that the entire load of the case now rests on him going into the next stage of appeal which would be before the high court and even at the last stage before the honorable supreme court act so considering this the job of the trial trial lawyer is that of laying the foundation of a case on which through the entire process of the case until its final disposal until the case is given a quietus the job is that of the trial lawyer to lay the foundation of it. Now, having said this, I, I would say that it is not so very difficult for us to realize, or for us to maybe, I, I would not be going overboard in saying that in our, in our legal profession, as such, conducting of a criminal trial is amongst, maybe amongst the most challenging task, if not, uh, I think, it, would, it could be safely said that it is definitely the most challenging task considering the load that it carries. Now, having said this, what I also would want to convey here is that primarily for those who are, for the, for the, for the younger generation as such of lawyers, for the youngsters who would want to be coming up as trial lawyers, what is necessary here is that Realization by you that you are conducting a criminal trial of the accused or the case is also a trial of yourself. It is your own trial in the sense that it is a trial of your perceiving. It is a trial of your sufficiency or insufficiency of the preparations that go into it. It is a trial of the efforts that you put, it is a trial of your career, it is a trial of your profession, it is a trial of your growth, and most importantly, it always remains a trial of your professional ethics. Now, having said this, the most important part, as I said, on, on which the basis of which this webinar is the most today is the preparation for the contest, for the contest known as a trial. Now, what happens in this preparation, especially the younger members of the bar, what happens in the, in the process of your preparation towards the trial? You need to first understand this, that if you get yourself filled with the knowledge that remains with 
you through the course of the trial yes but that remains with you through your entire other trials also through your entire career now we need to know this. when it comes to preparation as such we need to know this that no man can be strong where his knowledge of his subject and his task is given again okay? the preparation alone is what supplies knowledge which will make a trial lawyer very very strong i was just reading a quote of on trial lawyers recently and uh, a judge by name judge williams what he says is all are not alike let's say all lawyers are not alike if we have to specifically speak about our profession and if we have to relate this to our profession. all lawyers not alike all are not alike the cause or the efforts to a particular cause everybody puts is again not alike some may be better equipped by their very nature maybe they may be better talented some may be better equipped by their knowledge some may be better equipped by their education but nevertheless nevertheless i repeat this for everybody here maybe for the individual who is by nature talented individual who has prepared extreme level or for that matter i would rather say individual who has gained a very good education of course never irrespective of who it is nevertheless labor is the price of success to all and and this this is very important and it must be always paid in advance labor is the price of success to all and it must be paid in advance now what does this mean this is not difficult to understand for us what does it mean to succeed to do well there is a price it might be by sacrifices it might be by burning the midnight oil it might be by by being uh, tremendous efforts are such now this labor is always to be preceded this is to be preceded as it is success so the labor that we put forth is to be in advance and this holds very much uh, this for this is this holds very much relevance and importance and so too when it comes to our profession and more specifically when it comes to conducting a criminal trial as such so given this having said this what is also what is also necessary for us for criminal lawyers to understand criminal the trial lawyers to understand is that when it comes to preparation for a trial no judge of the case or before whom the case would be coming up the public prosecutor that would be opposing the criminal the defense lawyer or the trial lawyer would be better equipped neither of them neither the concerned judge or the court as such or nor the public prosecutor as such would be better equipped with the knowledge of the said case in hand which you are about to defend or of which you are about to conduct the trial the reason for this is the case the factual aspect of the case the entire case of the prosecution that would get unfolded before the court the trial lawyers have had a much ahead run way to it they have had a much ahead chance of going through the entire papers they have had the best chance of interacting they have had the best chance of also preparing for the trial so always know this necessary now it is necessary it is important that we cannot afford to fail in this duty or this obligation or this advantage that is on the trial lawyer again i repeat neither the judge before whom the case would be coming up nor the public prosecutor would be better equipped be to be totally thorough with the case on hand which the trial lawyer is going to defend or conduct trial now again once this is said it is necessary before an individual before a trial lawyer gets into a trial before the commencement of the trial there are some very basic principles very basic laws that govern the conduct conduct of the trial that every trial lawyer needs to know 
and this has to be studied thoroughly and research made into it. Once this is done, only then would a trial lawyer be equipped and go to the next steps of preparation of it. Now, these basic, these basic uh, uh, legal aspects, these basic laws are primarily chapter 23 of CRPC, which is which deals with the evidence in inquiries and trial. Then, uh, in, uh, then, uh, then you have section 162 of CRPC, which deals with the statement to police and the use of it. And with that also always goes another provision of the Evidence Act, which is section 145 of the Evidence Act, which is on cross-examination as to previous statements made in writing before the investigating officer or the police officer. Now, coming now to the steps towards the preparation of a criminal trial. I would, of course, I am not going by while, while I'm putting this across. Yes, this takes some reading as far as what steps, general rules are concerned, the ground rules. But this is primarily having read earlier, put into practice through these years. I would just sum up these in about seven to eight steps of I will first just jot down the just the seven or eight points which which are there. Firstly, is reading through the entire case, mastering the facts in the case, and of course, you know, the legal aspect, the research towards that is very much essential. The next is seeking instructions from the client. That's the second. The third is the visit to the scene of occur occurrence or the spot visit as such as we call it. Then the fourth again would be a second time instructions from the client for the discussion with the client. I'll just add a word of caution here. Client discussions never conclude, they never end. But prior to the commencement of the trial, these steps are necessary. Then comes the study on the witness. Next would be preparing how to establish the defense that is there in the case that has been instructed to you to the defense lawyer by the accused of And finally, it is the final argument which would be preceding the trial of such. Very important this is, the final arguments precede your trial. I will explain that to you later. Now, when it comes to the first step, which is reading through the entire case of now, it goes without saying that the defense lawyer, in almost every case as such, they have the entire prosecution case before them, entire documents that the prosecution relies upon much in advance. These documents, by way of a charge sheet file or final report file, comes to the defense lawyer well in advance it may be a few months, at times it may be a few years also. Rarely do we find a case where, I think at a very short notice, the, I think the, 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 there's a need for the defense lawyer to be prepared. Unless in some cases where the, the files come from another lawyer and the evidence has already come in. But generally, when a fresh case is taken up, the case facts of the case documents come to the defense lawyer well in advance. Now, with now, what happens here is there is a very clear mandate of law, section 207 of CRPC, by which every document the prosecution relies upon will have to be furnished to the defense well in advance. Without compliance with section 207 of CRPC, there is no question of, question of commencing or going further, even changing the charge. As such. Uh, this, this is something which everybody is aware of. Now, once these documents come, to the hands of the defense lawyer, a thorough reading of the entire file is very much essential. Now, by this, what I what I mean is that the exact allegation that the prosecution is intending to frame charge against the accused. The specific allegations made there in the charge, generally, which is found in column number seven of the charge sheet, one. Then the documents by way of oral evidence 
or by way of 161 statements of witnesses all of this is also forming the part of the charge sheet and in addition to that we have any other documents such as the report of the forensic science laboratory of or of any other expert it would also be in a case of murder a post mortem report report on the opinion of the expert on the weapon and even under 65 b any other record so what i mean to say here is that every single document is available to the defense lawyer prior to the commencement or much prior to the during the preparation of the case what needs to be done here is a thorough reading will lead to assessment assessment of the strengths of the prosecution which would be the primary witness or the star witness or the most important witness or the most important circumstance which the prosecution relies on or intends to rely upon at the stage of trial firstly every other witness that supports this primary witness now these would be the strengths of the prosecution case and the trial lawyer is required to make a very clear note of this because this this is what is going to stand against him which is is a hurdle for him to overcome at a later point of time this has to be primarily made a note of and the preparation into a trial would primarily go into that secondly and of course definitely this will not go uh, missing that the weaknesses of the prosecution also now by weaknesses generally what happens is there would be many flaws during the course of the investigation that has been conducted these flaws would be of various nature it can be anything it can be a blunder somewhere here or there or it can be anything. now these also is something the defense lawyer will have to be very much aware of prior to the conduct of the trial and during the preparation and importantly what is also required to be seen is to the strength that the defense has from the very charge sheet or from the very documents that the prosecution relies upon this is also these are the aspects that the defense or the trial lawyer has to make during the initial reading of the entire and of course it needs comes even the loopholes as such of whatever loopholes in the prosecution case now why is doing this what happens is many a times you come across very important loopholes in the prosecution case which will go and demolish the entire case of course or it can be loophole of a very wide aspect now in one of the trials that i was conducting a few years back which was three not two three not two trial there was a the prosecution had relied and which is always relied in in every case of such every murder case of such there was a spot panchanama conducted there is an inquest panchanama conducted at the inquest panchanama is conducted at the very same place where the spot panchanama conducted was conducted thereby thereby meaning that the body was lying in that particular place which in fact was a house now while the 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 spot panchanama was conducted the panchanam of the scene of occurrence was conducted prior to conducting the inquest panchanam and immediately thereafter the inquest panchanam was conducted now a thorough reading of the spot panchanam indicated that there is no mention of the dead body being there at the scene of occurrence i think we understand the meaning of meaning of this the in the spot when they were conducted they are essentially fed out the dead body indeed was there then there is it is very essential that it is made a note of in the spot picture at various points of time maybe during at the measurements that are given of every room as such what is lying in the room what is lying in the adjacent room what is the chakbandi or the schedule of the set place nowhere was it mentioned now 
subsequent to that, the inquest panchanama gets conducted at the very same scene of occurrence, and that is where the dead body is found. Now, what happens here is it is a thorough reading of the case as such. At times, we get to know these anomalies, and while during the cross examination, what happens, I, I will try to touch upon that, but the investigating officer would generally he will have no explanation, explanation to it, but yes, he will have only indicate that yes, there is a mistake on the part. How that mistake has happened is immaterial, but that mistake alone will never adhere to the benefit of the accused unless a very strong. Sir, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Uh, yes, slightly uh, the disturbance, we are not able to hear you very clearly. So, could you please increase the volume, sir? Perhaps that is one of the reasons I feel. I, am I better, Vikram, now? Akash, could you please confirm? Because at uh, my I end, it is... Uh, can you speak a little, you know, come near to the uh, device and speak louder? Am I better now, Akash? Yeah, this seems to be better. Better? Yes, I believe. Okay. What do you say, Trivikram? Sir, we'll go for uh, we'll go ahead for a few minutes. If there is any disturbance, I think I will uh, just mention it. I, I'll be disturbing you again in case of any disturbance. Let me know. Let me know, Vikram. Yes. All right. Was I Thank clear? You. Sorry, sorry. Was, was I clear now? You are clear, sir. Okay, great. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 no problem at all. So, what happens in such cases is that these flaws in the investigation and the charge sheet provided which would go to the root of the case of times. Now this sometimes this does not this does not come out of I think mere looking into the record system. This would come out or this would be learned of, or this would be hit upon by us, this would be seen by us only when a detailed reading of the record for them. So while while preparing for the trial, try and always make a chronological list of the events unfolding into the investigation, commencing from the general diary entry in the FIR, the timing and the date therein. That is very necessary. From that point of time, there is a, you need to make a chronological list as to how the investigation has unfolded through the entire investigation, including the dates on which the 161 statements of the witnesses has been recorded, so on and so forth. So having said this, now what also happens during this reading of the case, reading of the case papers, is that we master the facts of we master the entire facts of the case. We know the strengths and weaknesses of the prosecution. And this commences our work of knowing of what we, what is that as defense lawyers, as trial lawyers, we need to count. Now, the next stage we go to is getting instructions from the client. Now, this, this is among sometimes the harder of the task because very rarely do we have clients to come forth or come out openly about what actually has transpired. This even goes to the genesis of the incident. Now, many times the accused would not volunteer information. The accused would not many times volunteer information there, there will be a need to probe. You will have to ask questions over questions in a different manner. Sometimes they will also be said that we cannot handle the case. You are not forthcoming. You are not telling the truth. There, 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 it is the task of the trial lawyer to elicit all the factual aspects of the case and all the instructions that are required to defend the case. Now, once this is done, what happens is we at such stage of preparation feel or assume that after having done so much, 
the accused would have given all the information but no this does not always happen the accused we need to understand we are dealing with human nature it is not comfortable to be alleged of any any offenses or such now while the accused is not comfortable telling or coming out with the truth always so to that extent he has we extended the benefit now that is the reason they will need to prove now at times they would not come out fully with the genesis they would not come out fully with the facts they would not come out fully about their role or to what extent they were involved not involved what extent the prosecution story is false or true they would not now one very classical example which i with which i have come across during my uh, during my work as a trial lawyer is that i was defending a uh, offense under section 307 of ipc which is attempt to commit murder the case facts were quite simple the case facts were that the accused was a boy aged about 23 or 24 years old the allegation against him was that he he while he was in a hotel room with another gentleman aged about 55 or 60 years old over a fight that they had the accused takes a knife and stabs the individual on his abdomen now this was the fact and thereby attempted to commit his murder this was the fact based on which we went into trial but for some means the accused had not got bail and the accused did not want to also apply for bail for the reason that he had he was from a different state he had to go back he was he had nobody to actually offer bail to him so he opted to go ahead with the trial initial meetings with him initial instructions that were taken from him he stood by the story as no i had not done he stood that no there was a fight of but basically he did not come out with the truth now at the time of the evidence this man who was stabbed who is the victim the first witness as such he comes to the court to give evidence now as trial lawyers and even as experienced if you if have experienced trial lawyers here and even others as the juniors from the, the, the junior lawyers the bar Would, would always know that a three or seven trial is not easy to be conducted to, to be defended. A three or seven accused or an offence under section three or seven is not easy to be defended because there is the victim who speaks about the incident as such that led to his attempted murder. Now, when this witness was being examined before the court, he gave his evidence. He said a little background as such, and he said he tried to commit a murder. now to our shock he removes his shirt buttons and he displays his stomach he displays his abdomen he displays a portion of his stomach where the entire area of the part at least maybe measure at least about the, the whole part of it maybe it might be in inches measure as such even so the entire area as such there was stabbing and hospitalization if my memory is right was about almost 2 months almost 54 to 60 days now looking at this we had a real shock and at that point of time what could we do we could only stare at the accused as such questioning or asking to uh, uh, I mean, by our eyes asking him what is this or why have you not told us this post mortem oh sorry the uh, the wound certificate indicated injuries yes several injuries but no number as such nothing was specific there they had indicated a particular portion of the of body where they were injured now we had no other option but to seek time for cross examination that day we did not go ahead with the cross examination <clears throat> coming out after this evidence was recorded when while instructions were start from the client he told us certain things but the detailed instructions we had to secure by going to the prison now shockingly what had what had happened was this young man who was the accused aged about 23 or 24 years he had come for an 
searching for an employment to Bangalore. He was in majestic bus stand at night at about nine o'clock or ten o'clock, and at that point of time, this complainant victim comes there and basically interacts with the accused and asks him why he hasn't come to Bangalore, for what reason, and then he tells him that I have come in search for an employment. So he tells him, you know, why I I have my own industry, I have my own factory, or I can give you employment. You come along with me. This victim, or alleged victim, I would say, takes this young man to a restaurant for food, and he admin administers something in a soft drink that was consumed. He is then brought by the alleged victim to the hotel, and there. he tried to commit sexual assault on him in fact he had committed sexual assault on this young boy this boy when he woke up in the morning he realized what had happened primarily because he was nude and what he did he then immediately just he could lay his hands on a very small knife and in that fit of rage he just kept on stabbing on that man stop okay now this much for the facts what then what had also happened was that this individual when the case went to the police and when the complaint was given unfortunately the police had though uh, taken both the complaints our client informed us that he also has given a complaint and that had turned out to be into a fire also now once this complaint was there of the man who was injured there was the complaint also of the boy but that complaint though registered finally came to be closed the police for what reason we cannot say they closed that boy's complaint and i think at least that was not proceeded with but there was a charge sheet filed against this boy but once he once he came once he came out with this story of course we have the defense of there is a possibility of us self defense for a defense lawyer so what then happened again was the research work that made us do was section we think very few lawyers would know this especially the young people very few of them section 308 of ipc as against section 307 of ipc 307 of ipc is attempt to commit murder 308 of ipc attempt to commit culpable homicide not amounting to murder now we immediately thought the best way to do is to seek defense and the this to, to to portray the defense in a manner instead of a bare total denial we take we took shelter from that and finally of course the judge the uh, the judge the accused, the accused came out of prison at the very early stage and he did not there was no additional sentence additional sentence imposed on so this is where client instructions become very important the next the next part of the preparation is the spot visit that is necessary to be made now the visit to the scene of occurrence is very much essential in every aspects of a criminal case this is to know the truth or otherwise in the prosecution witnesses the version that they are coming forth with this is to know whether what kind of a defense can actually be taken whether the prosecution case is right whether the genesis is right or whether the witness who speaks about this is is telling the truth or is portrayed as the right witness so this is what is necessary and this is the benefit that comes out of a visit to the scene of occurrence now while doing this it is necessary to first know to first thorough be thorough with the spot concerning so it is also necessary to be thorough with what the witnesses speak of now in the year 161 statement and also this is also necessary to the extent to know whether the prosecution papers that are relied on the materials relied on by the prosecution are all correct gen <clears throat> now i will go here to another very important example very very a very valid example that i would want to give 
the benefit of which came gain from spot visit now we'll also hit up on one prosecution sorry one provision of law in the sense of spot inspection now the in a you know, defense of an accused who was very recent uh, uh, which trial was concluded very recently the case of the prosecution was at 9 pm the accused who was coming driving in his jeep was waylaid at a particular place and at that point of time when the raid was conducted there were two animal carcasses in his vehicle now this animal carcass was then seized two guns were seized from his possession both licensed and then of course it followed with an arrest now the entire police team were witnesses to this we these this this case is not easy to defend now what happened was at the time of our preparation for the trial we had the photographs at our at our disposal it was given to us by the prosecution and what we just went about it. by habit it is that you need you make a visit to the scene of occurrence and once you go there once we went there, we realized that the photographs that the prosecution relies as taken at the scene of occurrence immediately upon the seizure or the raid is not that particular place but is perhaps in some other place how did we get to know that well there is a vehicle there there are policemen the carcasses of the two animals that is also found there all of it is there so the background is seen there was a huge building at the background we would have taken hours maybe let's say we have taken sufficient time to search where is this building at that place where we had visited the scene of occurrence this building definitely was not there we had a confirmation we went to the adjacent streets also nothing then it was very clear for us that the seizure has at least this photograph are not taken at a place where the prosecution says that the seizure was made now this goes to the root of the prosecution case what happens now now very relevant again is this visit to the scene of occurrence is also supported by the provision now, once you are aware of this that there is a huge blunder or there is a huge inconsistency or a false portrayal of the prosecution case that that moment and in such cases it is almost the case is made or broken it is either you win or lose the case but essential the necessity is how are you going to portray this anomaly or how are you going to uh, show display this to the court that this itself indicates that the prosecution case is not right or it is absolutely false case. how do we do it? now what happens here is the moment the moment you know this your defense would be on the life and subsequently we were also informed by the accused that though the prosecution says that at 9 o'clock at night this was taken he we had instructions later from the accused that 5 o'clock in the morning before it was dark before the sun came out in the dark at 5 a.m. in the morning the police had taken him to some place and taken a photograph it was not the place from where he was taken by the police confirmation number 2 from instructions from the accused now the next thing happened was once we got to know this what happens is during the trial directly hold displaying this photographs to the to the witnesses including the investigating officer we told that this was not taken at the scene of occurrence this photograph it is taken at different place the person who conducted the person who actually drew the panchanama at the scene of occurrence he did not admit it but the investigating officer who was a dvsp who conducted the final investigation he candidly or rather he indirectly admitted that i cannot say where well, well, i cannot say whether this photograph was taken at the scene of occurrence 
So there ends the case of such as far as defense is concerned, because this goes to the root of the prosecution case, which finally ended up in an acquittal. Now, once this part of the this part of your preparation is over, which is a visit to the scene of occurrence, again there is a necessity to have a second client instruction. By this time, you are aware of many things. You know the chart sheet, you know you have made a visit to the spot, you have initial instructions from the accused. What next? Call the accused again, have a discussion with him, have a second interaction, interaction with the accused and know as to what exactly, what exactly uh, is the defense, what has passed And by this time, what is essential then is that you also need to study about the witnesses, their background and all of this. So this part of the preparation is also very essential. Once this is done, then you come to the most important part, I would say, which is your final article. Now, what I'm trying to portray here, what I'm trying to indicate here is the trial lawyer's final argument commences prior to the commencement of the trial itself. Prior to the commencement of the evidence itself. Why and how? Now, what happens while you prepare for a trial is that you conduct cross-examination of witnesses to lead you to the final argument at a later point of time upon the conclusion of the trial. You oppose certain depositions of the witnesses. You oppose the leading questions. You oppose the marking of the documents. Or you explain certain legal, legal issues that come up, keeping in mind your final argument. So the essential aspect here is that <coughs> your preparation for final argument in its entirety or almost in its entirety should happen prior to the commencement of the evidence. If you have that only, will you know what is the line of cross-examination you have to you have to carry on with, you have to commence, you have to commence. Only then would you get to know this. If you are thorough, let us say for example, you have section 27 of the Evidence Act, which generally we, we term it as, uh, which generally is termed as a recovery. Section 27 of the Evidence Act is otherwise known as a discovery of a fact. Now, for, for younger members of the bar who are not, not thorough with section 27 or for that matter any other legal aspects for, which is meant or which is required for a trial, what do you do? You need to know the essential principle or essential or the certain conditions precedent that are required to prove evidence under section 27. One of it is that the discovery of fact should not be in a public place. I'll just stop at that particular aspect of 27, nothing. When you know that the discovery of a fact should not be, or it will lose its importance in if it is in a public place, and if you know the judgments that are going to support you in that contention that you are going to raise at a later stage, you will know at that point of time that yes, <coughs> This evidence, this witness, this witness has spoken about this. I need to ask him whether it was a place accessible to the public. So only with this, and only with this, with your preparation, with the legal aspects of the case, with the preparation, with the evidence or, or the citation of the Supreme Court, would you know the line you have to follow as you cross examine the witness? Now, this is the reason I said. The, your preparation or your final argument will have to precede your the trial itself. Now, also let's go back to the initial quote I gave. You know, the initial the initial principle that I said was that the labor the labor is the price that we pay, and it has to be paid in advance. So the preparation into the case, including the citations of the case which are going to help you to cross-examine, will have to be in advance and it cannot be as the trial goes on. <clears throat> of course, as you 
go through as you gain experience you will know for example again taking the section 27 evidence factors of discovery of a fact having gained experience over a few years you will know what are the requirements of section 27 or uh, recovery or discovery of a fact to be proved but otherwise at the, at the commencement of at the commencement of your career as such as trial lawyer what is very much essential is that your final arguments need to precede your evidence now have it said this the i think that is the last aspect in your preparation yes now the next thing now the next thing i would want to go to is the stage of the actual trial now i think we have already reached 6650 it might take me i will try to run this a little faster here now with all this preparations now we are set with the trial we are set towards the commencement of the trial now the junior members of the bar bar of the younger trial lawyers and for that matter even even the more experienced trial lawyers would on the day prior to the trial commencement of the trial or even on the morning of the trial there is lot of anxiety there is lot of uh, nervousness but that is something and we always feel that have we prepared enough is it sufficient what about this what about that all these thoughts keep coming to our mind so when this when when this happens nothing new will happen so we need not carry this nervousness into a trial when like all of us initially do i do i even i have done i have i face this nervousness even at times i do it even now also so keep in mind always that thorough preparation that you have made on the facts and the law and your total knowledge of the case total knowledge of the law that governs that particular case of yours you have mastered now mere certain points i would want to put without elaborating anything as far as the uh, in respect of the rules that govern the cross examination now firstly go to the court a little early to examine or to observe or to observe the witness the benefits of this are tremendous primarily i would say at times we wouldn't get we will not get the real the true fact from even our client or from the accused we may not have got even the true fact even from the prosecution now once what happens once when you go to the court early you go there to gather or to observe the witness now these witnesses of course there are several categories of witnesses but primarily i would say three witnesses three kinds of witnesses assume importance which is one is a witness who is truthful secondly it is a witness who lies who is lying or who would be partly lying or we a witness who has been set up by the prosecution and lastly an innocent but an innocent but a truthful witness now this when you go to the court and observe these witnesses you know when you observe a witness who is truthful you will see the confidence in him you will also see that he may not be even referring he or she may not be even referring to any kind of a statement one six term statement he would not be interacting with any 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 person generally these would be the victims of the case or the portrait victims of the case so and then we would not even be seeing nervousness in this case. so once when that happens then the trial lawyer needs to be cautious what to ask what not to ask how much to go ahead the second witness is a lying witness or witness who has been set up now once you go to the court a little early you observe the witness <clears throat> that and make the witness known that the you are the lawyer who is going to cross examine him somehow convey and look at the witness look at the witness i to us some indication of nervousness from the witness will be displayed and that is a positive sign for a trial lawyer a lying witness would not be sitting confident today unless the said witness is not even bothered about the result of the case now the third is the third thing is an innocent an innocent but a truthful witness 
from such weaknesses, there, is, there are lots of things that, that can be brought up. By first, by, by gaining the confidence of the weakness and then asking some questions on the lines that we want and admissions are always going to come up to support the case of the defense. <clears throat> so once this part is over, the next is there is a necessity to be attentive during the chief examination. Now, this is also very important for the trial lawyer because the chief examination is not uh, coming, uh, what comes during the chief examination is not all that gets recorded as evidence. What comes out during chief, chief examination would give a lot of indications to the defense or trial lawyer as to on what line the cross examination can be conducted. Now, one, just one example I would want to give here. There was, I, we, we were defending a three or four a accused where death by negligence due to motor vehicle accident. It's a, it's a very, it's the simplest of trials that a trial lawyer will conduct. Three or four a. Now, during the, there is, this is a witness. There was an eyewitness. And I think we are all aware that most of these cases, the eyewitnesses are primarily set up. Now, as the, the incident is said to have occurred at about 6 p.m. in the evening when the person, when the deceased was returning to his house from the office. When the witness, what the witness says, yes, on so and so date, he was going by, he, was, he saw the incident. And he says he was going for his walk and then he saw the incident at that point. Of course, the court recorded that he did not, the court, the, the learned magistrate did not record about the witness going for a walk. Just merely whatever was in the 161 statement, that aspect was recorded. Now, the incident is said to have occurred at 6 p.m. in the evening. Now, having, the, having been attentive during the chief examination, and the witness has said he was going for a walk. For the trial lawyer, something should strike immediately. Can I proceed on that line? Walk. No. For the when you you begin the I began the cross examination of the witness was begun. He was asked, Do you go regularly for morning walks? Yes. Every day? Yes. Without missing? Yes. On that day also you went for a morning walk? Yes. What time did you go? I went at so and so for point of time. Then he said we got a clear admission that at 6 a.m. in the morning he saw the accident. What happened, sir? If at all the evidence, if the, if the, uh, if the trial counsel or if the cross examining counsel was not present, maybe this aspect would have been missed. So the being there at the, when the chief examination takes place is very important. Now, the commencement of the cross examination. Now, this is all where the preparation helps. Now, as I said earlier, there are certain basics to be known prior to even standing up a cross examination, which is the law in respect of omissions, contradictions, improvements, and so on and so forth. There are, there are, there are so, so many things of which we have, which could be considered as basic. Now, certain rules while cross-examining the witnesses, I would want to put maybe in similar sentences or a brief elaboration of that. Now, try not to make an inquiring cross-examination or a probe, probing cross-examination or a investigative cross-examination. There be, it can be hazardous, it can be dangerous, primarily because certain answers may come out about which you are not even aware of. It can even go against you and it can even strengthen the prosecution case already that might be against you. So try not to go to the probing line. Unless you are very sure that you have already the worst of the case and in the probing manner, if you go, it is, not, it is not going to uh, hamper your case in any manner, so you do it. Otherwise, no. Then, don't ask questions for which you do not know the answer. Try not to do it. Again, it goes back to the first, first point, which is not to go in the probing manner. Now, the next thing is a very important thing, which is, as a cross-examiner, you need to know where and when to stop. <clears throat> you need to know I have asked this much, I have to stop here, no further. The rule here is stop one question or one answer earlier. So, meaning 
do not ask that one extra question in the anxiety sometimes when the witness is admitting to certain things and in a certain way you are leading the witness you the trial lawyer the cross examiner becomes a little excited and in that anxiety one extra question asked may ruin the entire answers which we got which were which were which the trial lawyer succeeding succeeded in taking out of the witness is small so you need to know where to stop so next thing is you try not to repeat a question for which you have already got an answer from one of the witness who would be who could be termed as reliable i will just repeat that try not to ask a question to a second witness when second witness or more witnesses when from one of the witnesses who could be termed as reliable you have already got an answer let us say you have a defense that the accused left the house at 9 o'clock whereas the prosecution case is that up to 10 or the incident happened at 10:30 and the accused was in the house now there is a this witness who is there who could according to you the trial law as assessment could be termed as a very reliable witness if you establish from that witness that the accused had left the house at around 9 at 9 o'clock or around 9 o'clock in the morning and if it is established to the extent that you could argue it is reliable then try and never ask this question with any other witnesses in the trial okay the reason here is first always when you when you are adopting this you need to know this very important thing there are several judgments of the supreme court which would say one stray sentence will not make us disbelieve the witness or disbelieve the other witness that is why i i stressed upon the word reliable witness or where you can argue it is a reliable witness what happens if you ask to the next second or third witness that witness may say no the he was he left at about 10 or 11 o'clock another one may say he left at about at the same time now while you go for your final argument if you had stopped at the first witness who says 9 o'clock he left then you would pose to the call you challenge the prosecution to say only witness that speaks about what time the accused has left the home is at 9 o'clock in the morning there is not a single other witness who has given any kind of a contrary version to this is that not enough on the other way if from the second and third witnesses if you try to in your eagerness want to establish the same 9 o'clock 9 am time again those witnesses would say 10 10:30 or 11 o'clock. What happens? What would happen to your argument? Yes, you would say 9 o'clock. You will tone down your arguments to say that this is a reliable witness and not them. Why should the court believe that, or why should the court accept the argument? Prosecution will say maybe this witness says 9 o'clock. Maybe he may not be able to prove it, but the other witnesses say it is 10 or 10:30. So this is very important. Try not to ask the same question a second time. then subsequently we also need to master we also need to know how to use this 161 statement to towards the conclusive defense now at times 161 statements we need, need to know are the prosecution so read it thoroughly and anything that is very near to your defense from a 161 statement hold on to it use it fully with the witness then also treat the investigating officer as a very important witness in, and this will be in several cases as such now this towards this conclusion as such i would only give i think it's just a seven five i'll just conclude in about two or three minutes now now investigating officer attains importance in certain cases primarily when it is documentary evidence and also primarily when it is offense alleged or where the where the uh, allegation against the accused arises only out of criminal conspiracy and nothing and no direct overlap now in one of our cases which was a cbi case this there was the allegation against the primary accused 
who was the managing director of a uh, managing director of a company or he was managing partner of a firm he is the one who had borrowed from the bank which was a uh, which to the tune of about 10 crores now he got he got a bank when, when he wanted a mortgage that mortgage said i also want to be a partner with you and only then will i mortgage my property so this primary accused had not he had no other way he said okay come you become a partner and you mortgage your property thereby the advance was expensed over now what happened finally this turned out to be an np and the the, the amount was not repaid the allegation was that these secured along with a few others they conspired they conspired to defraud the bank and primarily the prosecution cbi held to the fact that no despite several reminders no payments are being made the conduct of the accused is not good so on and so forth it is not easy for the borrower to get away the person who owes the money to the financial institutions to get away from a criminal prosecution when primarily the money has to come from him he is the person to whom advance was paid now during the cross examination of the investigating officer what happened was we were clear our defense was very clearly set up it was a case where the it like the bank the case of the cbi was that the bank was now sorry the allegation was that the properties which the mortgager partner mortgager the partner had mortgaged were fraudulent property there were several sales and agreements on that property earlier there was no title with the mortgage so the bank's case was that these accused along with others they had criminally conspired to obtain an advance by mortgaging this property which was fraudulent now our defense was like the bank this secured the primary borrower also got to know only along with the bank and only when the bank informed that the property mortgaged was fraudulent property not otherwise never before that now the defense the, the, the prosecution version was that right from the beginning there was a conflict our now during the defense again preparation here played a very vital role we exhibited email communications we exhibited the prosecution's own documents which said that the bank is informing the borrower about the fraud about the forged documents this was the now the investigating officer had one case had one document which was an agreement which was given to the bank at the time of extending the loan now investigating officer's case was that at the time of extending the loan in this particular agreement the accused the primary accused had signed he was aware of the documents being forged now that document was with the bank also our case was very simple it is that document which was with the knowledge of the bank also with the knowledge of the accused and nothing else a clear question was posed to the investigating officer <clears throat> to allege conspiracy or during your investigation to indicate conspiracy or to show that the the primary accused had conspired do you have any other material other than this agreement of course as an investigating officer that took from the cbi there would have been several attempts uh, he made several attempts to say no this or that and this document that document now the cross examiner here again what attains important here is at that point of time you have thoroughly gone through all the documents that the cbi is relying on you know other than this agreement there is nothing so when the investigating officer said no there are other documents there are 161 statements the cross examiner boldly asked the investigating officer show me one more 161 statement which indicates conspiracy investigating officer goes through so many statements he says so it is not available then next question is other than this document do you have any other document to indicate there was conspiracy he says he says yes but by by that time he knew nothing more is there he says this is sufficient for me the next question was was this also within the knowledge of the bank yes that document was within the knowledge of the bank that document was within the knowledge of the accused finally when the last question again was asked other than this document do you have any other document to indicate conspiracy by the accused the answer by the investigating officer was 
No, I do not have any other question. What happens here? A thorough study made and clear instructions that come from the client is definitely going to help us a lot in, in defense. Of course, trial work is not easy. As I said, trial work requires a lot and lot of lot, lots of uh, what you call hard work, burning midnight oil, a lot of sacrifice. So the preparation into a trial, and of course, it is very important how you have the strategy the case and the case as such, defense as such is very important. So with this, I would say that these are the basic steps and certain rules that one will have to bear in mind going into a trial. So I think with that, I, I will conclude. Shavikram, Shavikram. Thank you, sir. Uh, indeed, 